Let's talk about how each of the Christoffel symbols, the first and second kind, changes in response to a change in coordinate systems. Suppose I had a metric tensor with components g sub ij in the x super i coordinate system. Let's consider a coordinate transformation where I go from the x super i coordinate system, where i is some index that varies from 1 to n, and is the dimension of the space we're considering. Let's say we go from the x super i coordinate system to a new coordinate system x super i bar. In this new coordinate system, suppose my metric tensor components transform to g sub i bar. Now since the metric tensor is a covariant tensor of rank 2, it has two sub-indices, this is the transformation law for the metric tensor as we move to a different coordinate system from the x super i to the x super i bar coordinate system. And I'm going to call this equation 1. Notice how the two partial derivatives here have the barred coordinate at the bottom and the unbarred coordinate at the top. Because this is a covariant tensor transformation law, the barred coordinates for each covariant rank will be at the bottom of the partial derivative. And that's how you know that this is the transformation law for a rank 2 covariant tensor. Let's now go on the side and talk about the Christoffel symbols. Recall from the last video that the Christoffel symbols of the first kind are given by the following expression in terms of the metric tensor, while the Christoffel symbols of the second kind are given by this expression, which involves both the Christoffel symbol of the first kind and the inverse metric tensor, which has contravariant components. It's a rank 2 contravariant tensor. So if I wanted to find how the Christoffel symbols transform under a change of coordinates, I need to know how the derivative of the metric tensor component with respect to a coordinate transforms under a change of coordinates, because that's basically what shows up in the equation for the first kind Christoffel symbol. But how do we do that? Well, I take the transformation law for the rank 2 covariant metric tensor, and I differentiate that transformation law with respect to x super k bar. And that'll give me the transformation law for the partial of the metric tensor component with respect to the coordinate. This is already looking pretty algebraically cumbersome, but let's continue by applying the product rule to the expression on the right-hand side and basically grouping the last two derivatives together. So now I apply the product rule again to the second term on the right, which will give me the following. And if you want to find the derivative of g sub rs with respect to x super k bar, and express that in terms of the derivative of an unbarred coordinate, you're going to have to use the chain rule. The way to do that is to think of g sub rs as a function of the unbarred coordinates, so x super 1, x super 2, all the way to x super n, with each of these unbarred coordinates being themselves functions of the barred coordinates, one of which includes x super k bar. This is the inverse transformation, after all, going from the barred coordinates to the unbarred coordinates, which g sub rs is a function of. So if I want to find the partial of g sub rs with respect to x super k bar, I can use the chain rule, recognizing that each of these unbarred coordinates is in general a function of x super k bar. So the partial of g sub rs with respect to x super k bar is the partial with respect to x super 1 times the partial of x super 1 with respect to x super k bar, plus the partial of g sub rs with respect to x super 2 times the partial of x super 2 with respect to x super k bar, and so on and so forth. You can easily convert this to a summation with the dummy index t that's on the unbarred coordinate, and then using Einstein notation you can write this as the partial of g sub rs with respect to x super t times the partial of x super t with respect to x super k bar, where t is the dummy index you're summing over. We know it's a dummy index because it's repeated twice, one of the main rules of Einstein notation. If I now plug this into the expression for the partial of the barred metric tensor component with respect to x super k bar, this is what I'll get. I'll now combine these partial derivative terms and take g sub rs common to get this slightly less cumbersome expression. I'm going to call this equation 2. Now, this equation tells you some important things. It tells you that the partial of the metric tensor with respect to a coordinate does not transform like a tensor unless we only look at affine coordinate transformations, or coordinate transformations in which the x super i bar coordinates are linear combinations of the x super i coordinates. The reason for this is that in an affine coordinate transformation, the second order mixed partial derivatives become zero, and you end up with a transformation law corresponding to a covariant tensor of rank 3. This leads me to my next point, which is that when we only look at affine coordinate transformations, the partial of the metric tensor with respect to a coordinate transforms like a covariant tensor of rank 3. Now, since the Christoffel symbol of the first kind directly involves this metric tensor partial derivative, it makes sense that the first kind Christoffel symbol has three indices in the subscript. 
And because of this relationship between the first kind Christoffel symbol and the metric tensor's partial derivative, this Christoffel symbol also follows the same rules. It doesn't transform like a tensor unless we have an affine coordinate transformation. And when it does transform like a tensor, it transforms like a rank three covariant tensor. So now that we've discussed these two properties, let's bring back the expression for the first kind Christoffel symbol, which is given by this by definition. Now, regardless of whether you have an unbarred coordinate system or barred coordinate system, the definition of the Christoffel symbol doesn't change. So I can just add a bar to each of these terms to get the expression for the barred Christoffel symbol, the Christoffel symbol of the first kind you get after the coordinate transformation. So in the barred coordinates. Now in this transform Christoffel symbol expression, I've already found this third term, the partial of g sub ij bar with respect to x super k bar. I just need to find these other two terms. This shouldn't be too difficult since I've already got this partial derivative from equation two, which I'll copy paste here. I can easily now find the other two partial derivatives just by replacing the ijk indices by different ijk indices and doing the same with the rs and t indices. So for instance, if I want to find the partial of g sub j k bar with respect to x super i bar, and I start with the equation for the partial of g sub i j bar with respect to x super k bar, I just take the equation two, which I'm starting out with, I then replace the k by the i, the i by the j, and then the j by the k. And so then it'll match things up. The other thing I'll do is change my dummy index r to s, then s to t, and then t to r in this first term, and then switch the r and s dummy indices in the second term. The reason I can make this dummy index switch is that the dummy indices are summed over because they're repeated twice, and since they're summed over, they won't even be in the final expression, so I can designate the dummy index in each term as whatever I want as long as I'm consistent with where I'm placing it, which I am over here. This is in fact rule number one of Einstein notation if you've seen my video on it. Now when I do all this I get an expression that I'll call equation 3. Bear in mind that I'll have to change the r to s and the s to r in the second expression. And lastly if I want to find the partial of g sub ki bar with respect to x super j bar and I'm starting with equation 2 then I can take that equation replace the k by the j, the i by the k, and the j by the i to get my expression for the partial of g sub ki bar with respect to x super j bar. Once again, I'll replace the dummy indices r, s, and t in the first term by t, r, and s respectively, and I'll also switch the r and s in the second term, same idea as before. When I make this index switch, I get this equation, which I'll call equation 4. Now if I want the transformed Christoffel symbol of the first kind, I want its transformation law, I need to add equations three and four and then subtract equation two and then take half of everything in the end. When I do that, I first end up with the following, which is a pretty cumbersome expression, but it's not all bad because I can simplify things a bit by canceling out these mixed partial derivative terms. Now, this cancellation assumes that your coordinate transformation is composed of equations that are continuous and differentiable, Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to switch the order of the mixed partial derivatives, which is basically what we exploit here in order to simplify our expression. The next thing I'll do is that in each of these expressions involving the partial of the metric tensor component with respect to a coordinate, I will take these three partial derivative products common because they show up with each of these metric tensor partial derivatives. When I do that, this is what I end up with. If you now look at this first term in the parentheses, do you notice something? Well, it looks kind of familiar. It looks like the Christoffel symbol of the first kind with indices R, S, and T, so I'll make that substitution here. If I now look at the second term in the braces, and if I switch the R and the S because they're dummy indices, so I can switch whatever I want, as long as I'm consistent, this is what I get. Now g sub r s and g sub s r are the exact same since the metric tensor is a symmetric tensor which means that I can actually combine these two expressions in the braces to end up with my complete simplified transformation equation for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind and I'm going to call this equation 5. The inverse transformation equation so going from barred coordinates back to the unbarred coordinates for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind looks very similar. You just take equation 5 and change the barred terms to unbarred terms and the unbarred terms to the barred terms. If you do that you end up with this expression which I'll call equation 6. So we've determined the transformation law of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. Let's now work on the transformation law of the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. Recall from earlier in the video that the Christoffel symbol of the second kind is given by the following expression. 
If I write this in terms of barred coordinates, this is what I'll have. Now, I know how the Christoffel symbol of the first kind transforms already, so I know the equation of gamma sub jkm bar in terms of the unbarred first kind Christoffel symbol. If I substitute that from equation 5, this is what I'll get. Now, since the g super im bar is a contravariant tensor of rank 2, it also follows a transformation law, which looks something like this, where the partial derivative terms containing the barred coordinate are in the numerator and the unbarred coordinate are in the denominator. This is the transformation law for a contravariant tensor. If I now plug this into the second kind Christoffel symbols transformation law, this is what I'll get. Let's now expand things out to end up with the following. Now the nice thing about this expression is that I can actually combine some of these partial derivatives, particularly ones where the variable being differentiated is a barred coordinate, and the variable being differentiated with respect to is the same barred coordinate in two different partial derivative terms. When I do that, I can combine these partial derivatives and land myself with a Kronecker delta symbol. In the first case, the Kronecker delta symbol is 1 when t equals v and 0 otherwise, so I can replace all the v's in the first expression by t's. And in the second case, the Kronecker delta symbol is 1 when s equals v and 0 otherwise, so I can replace all the v's by s in the second expression. When I do this replacement, this is what I end up with. The first term looks very similar to the Christoffel symbol of the second kind in the unbarred coordinates. So if I make that substitution and if I recognize the fact that the product of these components of the inverse metric tensor and the regular metric tensor is another Kronecker delta, this is what I end up with. Again, this Kronecker delta is only 1 when u equals r and is 0 otherwise, which simplifies our expression even further to the following. And when the dust settles, this is the overall transformation law for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, which I'll call equation 7. Notice once again that if my mixed partial derivative is 0, so under an affine coordinate transformation, the Christoffel symbol of the second kind transforms like a mixed tensor with contravariant rank 1 and covariant rank 2, which makes sense. It has one index at the top and two indices at the bottom, contravariant rank 1, covariant rank 2. We can also formulate the inverse transformation version of this transformation law, so when going from the barred coordinates back to the unbarred coordinates, all we gotta do is take equation 7 and change the barred terms to unbarred terms and the unbarred terms to the barred terms. And if you do that, you end up with something which I'll call equation 8. So there you go. The transformation law for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. So in the end, we've shown the transformation laws for both the Christoffel symbols of the first kind and the second kind. A bit algebraically cumbersome, but we managed. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.